<laughs> I see they're at the ready. Um, we have a treat today in that we have three uh, DNR uh, Parks and Trails staff professionals with us today to kind of share the greater regional recreational perspective and where these pieces fit in in our region. Um, Wade Miller is the director of parks, area supervisor, area supervisor of parks. Um, in the back, Paul Roth is the Crow Wing State Park Director. And kicking us off is Steve Weber, who is the director of the State Recreation Area, the Cuyuna Country State Rec Area. Did I say that correctly? And I think uh, with no further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I got it. Oh, yeah. Can <laughs> um, we get turn the lights down a little bit? I will. Okay. Somewhere. Don't mean to get too bossy here, but. <laughs> Okay, like Todd said, I'm Steve Weber, a manager of the Cuyuna Country State Recreation Area. Uh, the rec area was established in 1993. It encompasses 5,000 acres, and it's uh, mostly in the old mineland area of Cuyuna. You know, the Cuyuna Range, there's a north and a south range, and there's a south range. And um, it, it, it has probably about 12 mine lakes in it. And uh, the mine lakes are clear, they're deep. Uh, the deepest one is 525 feet deep and scuba divers flock to it. We're gonna talk about recreation today, so I'll sprinkle it with kind of what the recreational activities are out there. Um, the, the cover photo I put on is, is of a yurt. We, we put out yurts a couple of years ago and we opened them about a year and a half ago. And we have three of these out here on the Yaki Mine Lake and it's like a 14 acre lake that's 150 feet deep mine lake again. And uh, these are set up with a, a, a locker, food locker, you know, to keep the critters out. And then a food shelter here, and we have a picnic table under there. We have a fire ring here right now. This is a construction picture. And then we have another picnic table out here. And then they go inside there and they do their camping. There can be uh, seven people can camp in there at once. And the little dome up there that, that raises and lowers, if it's too hot, you open it up and the hot air escapes and you drop it down when it's a little cooler out. But they're available year round, 55 bucks during the week and 65 on weekends. So it's not a bad deal at all. Um, let me see if I can get this right. Okay, these are part of the, you know, the MCC crew who put the furniture together, came in a bunch of pieces. But in each one, there's three bunk beds and this is a futon bunk bed where this falls into a bed, and then there's another uh, bed on top. And then uh, there's a fireplace uh, or a wood stove in each one of them too. So, and then in the center, there's a, there's a table with chairs and benches, and there's a rocking chair, and uh, they're, they're 20 foot uh, round, so, and there's three of them. So, they're very popular. Right now, you can't get a reservation on a weekend until like November. So, uh, you can still find a couple during the week that are open, but it's tremendously uh, busy. <clears throat> um, also in the recreation area, we have the Croft Mine Historical Park. This is Richard Snook. Uh, he's been involved about 27 years there. Uh, we kind of inherited him when we, uh, when, when we got, got the building and facilities, and it's a good thing because he, he knows the history real well. And then that building right there, that's one of the last standing structures on the Cuyuna Range. That's a dry house, and the dry house served as a locker room for the miners. The miners would, would go in there, change into their mining clothes, and then they would go down the shaft. This is a, a, uh, the actual shaft right here. It's 630 feet deep, but it's capped with concrete right now. And then these are the shiv wheels that were located on the top of something like that. This is called a head frame, and this is a simulated head frame. You know, the original one was, was recycled years ago, so we're trying to simulate the experience of what it was like years ago. So uh, you come up here and the tour guide is giving you the you know, lowdown, what's going on, and then you jump in an elevator and you go down, and then you go into the, into the uh, uh, underground right here, I guess. But you're actually at ground level, but you're covered up. And, and uh, what we have in there is probably about 150 foot Bebo, just like the Bebo for the Paul Bunyan Trail. This was actually the first Bebo in the area. Um, and then they built um, the interpretive uh, structures inside that. What's Bebo? It's, it's just a concrete span, you know, and then, and then you got your, you know, openings underneath to drive cars, drive uh, bicycles, and in this case we put a, you know, interpretation in there. 
So we've got the, the, the rail, railroad, and we explain how that works, and the cars, and dropping the ore down from one to another. And, and this stuff here was done, you know, real authentically because we had some of the miners provide some input on that. So it's a, it's a real good experience, but we only have enough money to operate that on Saturdays and Sundays, 10 to 6. So right now there isn't any charge if you just show up. You can go through the Dry House Museum, spend some time in there looking at pictures and old artifacts. And then Richard will, will take you in here, not for an official tour, but he's there to answer questions and then he'll give you half a tour, you know. Where's that located? That's uh, in Crosby, north of Crosby. Um, if you know where the subway station is or the four-way stop in Crosby, it's about a half mile north of there. And then you'll see the signs. In, um, so that's the Croft Mine. Um, let's see, anybody know what this is? Okay, this is a semi-truck that comes up several times a year. And, they, and this is all, all these little bins up here are filled with trout. And we put about 50,000 rainbow and brook trout in the mine lakes. You know, we don't in parks, but fisheries does that for us. And they, they back that big one down to our major accesses like the Sagamore, the Pennington, and the Portsmouth where we have concrete accesses. <clears throat> and then the smaller dirt accesses, they, they take these pickup trucks in. So they take some of the fish out of there, put them in their little aerated tanks, and then they drive to the smaller lakes on that. So this kind of gives you an idea of you know, some of the activity in the spring that the, the fisheries uh, do. If anybody knows Owen Baird, there's Owen right there kind of supervising things, and that's kind of our program. And, and you know, fishing, uh, trout fishing just opened up last weekend, and it goes till October 31st um, for the open water. And then a couple years ago, our advisory council said, how about, how about winter fishing? Why not winter fishing? So we took that idea of the fisheries, and they said, yeah, we can handle that, you know. It might stock it a little different, but we can handle that. So uh, two years ago, we opened it up for uh, fishing in the winter, and that's been tremendously popular. And that's what it looks like after they dump the fish in. You know, you can stand there, the water's so clear, and just kind of watch them swim around, get you a little excited for fishing. And there's a kid, you know, uh, did some winter fishing, and he caught uh, a rainbow trout. That's the Yaki Lake, and... Uh, about five minutes later, I went back, uh, you know, just on the other side of the lake and ran into this guy. And, and he got a lake trout in that lake. Um, and it's a tremendous size. And, you know, we're not going to probably see many that big coming out of there, but that's a nice size fish for a 14 acre lake. Who would have thought that fish would be in there? Yep. Did he release no. Nope. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> Are you going to like leave right now and go out there? <laughs> okay, because the, uh, there's 26 miles of shoreline, undeveloped shoreline out there. And, uh, you know, most of that is on the mine lakes. And the water is real clear. There's visibility of like probably 30 to 40 feet, you know, in the summertime. In the wintertime, it could be 50, 60 feet. And that's, that's outstanding visibility. You know, the, the next uh, place around that has that is Lake Superior. So the, the scuba diver flock up here. This is a, a dive school that's put on by the Brainerd School of Diving there. And it's a commercial dive school. They do underwater welding and cutting and things like that. You know, it's because they get these guys trained in and certified to work on bridges and do real industrial type stuff. And this is kind of what their setup is. You know, they've got a, a heater to heat the water, and they've got just all sorts of communication things, and it's just a real production when they come out. Uh, and then they got the, the hard hats, and uh, they look a little different than the wreck divers. These are the wreck divers. Um, you know, they just throw up a, you know, a tarp and get suited up and, and dive in. And this is not uncommon to see that on a weekend, you know, if you know the right spots to go where they scuba dive. Uh, there's a lot of that. Um, we allow hunting in the recreation area, and so uh, because we allow hunting, we thought, well, since people set up targets everywhere out there, let's try to organize them and, and bring them together in a safe place. So we created our own little rifle site in, and we had a scout build the tables for us, and we have two targets set up at 20 yards to get, or 25 yards to get initially set up, and then the rest are at 100. And we have about 120 people show up annually. We did it for 18 years. Last year we couldn't do it, and I'm not sure if we're gonna do it this year. But we had all sorts of people come, and we get everything set up with the spotting scopes and the targets, and it's a free event, and you know we're the most popular people in Minnesota that day. 
Uh, there's a lot of water sports going on out there. You know, there's canoeing, kayaking, paddle boarding is picking up. Um, so we see a lot of that. This is this is very typical. You know, you got the you got the um, hammock up there. You got the a couple of mountain bikes there, and they got you know the family eating, and you see a lot of that going on. That's at our new trailhead. This is a, another picture from our new trailhead uh, during a race. There's a big big parking lot to the left, another big parking lot to the right, and then we got some green space in between with a nice view of the lake. And then we provided access to the, this is a Huntington Mine Lake. And so we have like a, uh, you know, a big uh, sidewalk that winds on down there where you can go fishing or swimming down there. Uh, we do a lot of races, mountain bike races. Um, this, this past year we had uh, the high school league in here and we had 750 high school kids racing, you know, in October. And, and it's just a tremendous, I mean, this is just a part of them. And, and it's just like, you know, they bring their, their parents, there's 2,000, easy, you know, 2,000 people there at that, on that day. And they, you know, the parents and family are lining it and clapping and supporting and uh, it, was, it was a beautiful event, I tell you. And this happened the day before, you know, they had a Ormageddon race, they called it. And that was for just regular recreational riders. But, you know, the mountain bikers are taking over and they're doing mountain biking in the winter time too now. It's called fat biking. And we grew them close to 40 miles of trail out there for fat biking. Um, and this is a picture of our, our new trailhead. You know, again, the parking up top there, and then parking down there, you know, with the center section and then the access to the lake down there. Well, here we are at Crowing State Park. Uh, welcome to Crowing. Has every, who hasn't been there? Okay, you have to come and visit. <laughs> this is a picture from Chippewa Lookout looking up the Mississippi River. The reason it's named Chippewa Lookout is because of a significant battle in um, 1767 between the Dakota and Ojibwe. Um, real interesting story, and if you want to know more about it, in that reading list, I've got uh, a book called Old Crowing. It's it's got it's uh, I think on the top of it, but it uh, talks about the. The old crowing book talks about some of the major events and things that happened at crowing, and that's a, it, gives, it provides a good overview. Uh, here's a picture from one of the interpretive panels in the, our old crowing town site, and that's a picture of a guy named Pete Humphrey. And Pete was really one of the uh, more influential people who got crowing established in, uh, they started in 1957, Crowing was established because of its historical significance, because of the old town of uh, the town of Old Crowing, which basically existed between the 1820s, 1830s, and 1867. And the reason it died out is because the railroad came through this area and went further north, and then a town called Brainerd started up, and then Crowing uh, died out. And the other thing too that happened was the Ojibwe uh, people were moved to the White Earth Indian Reservation. Um, and anyway, Pete um, started working on, on getting the park established in 1957. There was some legislation um, uh, written that said if, if people could, uh, in the Brainerd area could uh, come up with $15,000 to help purchase land that the legislature could come up, up with 15,000. And by 1962, they had purchased like 450 acres to start the park. Um, and Pete was also one that wrote the, um, or that co-authored the old crowing book. And also if you go into the library at Central Lakes College, there's a Humphrey Museum. Have anybody been there? And that, that was um, from the things that Pete had. And here's a picture of uh, our boardwalk going through the old crowing town site. Um, at its highest uh, level of population, when maybe the ox cart drivers and loggers were in town, uh, crowing probably had about 600 people in it at one point in time. One thing that's really uh, interesting is in 1830, there were probably 500 or so um, European people in Minnesota. 
So that was 1830, by 1890, there was about a million and a half. So the, the Native Americans really had a lot to deal with during that time frame. <coughs> so um, yeah, this has interpretive panels that talk about the town site, the Mississippi River. You're looking at the Mississippi River here. And that's a house in the town called the Bolio House. A, a fur trader named Clement Bolio built that in 1849. Uh, it's kind of interesting uh, the, the town had a lot of uh, very neat, unique people uh, that passed through and had lived there. There were fur traders named Aiken, Bolio, Fairbanks, um, Warren, William Whipple Warren wrote a book called The History of the Ojibwe. And we have small towns in northwestern Minnesota called Bolio and Warren and counties Aiken, uh, Crowing County. Crowing came from the town of Crowing. Morrison County were uh, names from people who had been some of the early fur traders and movers and shakers in the town of Old Crowing. So it's a really neat place to go to. If you, you know, like a lot of people talk about a sense of place. If you want to get an idea of a sense of place for this area, this is a really good place to start. And Crowing has. Uh, a lot of the things that, that most state parks have, we have camping, 59 campsites, 12 are electric, we have a camper cabin, and there's a, our camper cabin, um, very popular, people really enjoy that. Picnic shelter, which is at the beginning or end, of whatever way you're going of, of the Paul Bunyan bike trail. Um, and that's open to the public, uh, people do rent it, reserve it for family gatherings, different things. And that's also the, the beginning, uh, the area where you would walk past to get down to the old Crowing town site. And we have 18 miles of hiking trail. Uh, one thing we've had every year since I think it's 1987 is Crowing Canoe Days and Fur Trade Encampment. And it was always the first part of June. Now we're moving it to Saturday, August 6th. So if you want to put that on your calendar, Saturday, August 6th. And that's a day when people can canoe from Kiwanis Park in Brainerd to Crow Wing uh, and then get a shuttle back to your vehicle. And then the Crow Wing County fur traders set up a fur trade encampment. And sometimes the fur trade encampment is a little bit smaller than what you're seeing here, but uh, it's always uh, got a lot of interesting things going. Uh, the people in the Crowing County Muzzleloaders Club have been, most of them have been in it for a long time. And they're very, very knowledgeable about the history of the old fur trade era and crowing. Uh, we do have weekly, every Saturday night, generally in July and August, we try and have an interpretive program. This is uh, Ted Fighter from Brainerd. Ted does a, just an excellent job uh, with a campfire sing-along. And this shows um, one of the, the start of the development of the Paul Bunyan bike trail. A lot of the construction jobs aren't pretty. Uh, yeah, we had to, uh, it didn't, doesn't seem like you should have to, but, but we did uh, a lot of, uh, Timber was removed and a lot of dirt was moved around. We were fortunate to have Anderson Brothers Construction in Brainerd uh, get the contract to, to build the trail. Uh, they did a, just a fantastic job. And there's another look at construction. That's right by our park office um, looking out uh, toward the uh, east from, from the office. It is new, yeah, it was, was built in uh, 2014, cons completed, and then uh, 2015 was um, the first full year that we had it. And this is looking from the office down toward the picnic shelter. And um, yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it's very, very well used. And I was amazed last year, you know, for our first full year of, of having this section of trail open. And the section of trail um, in the park runs 6.2 miles from our picnic shelter parking lot up to the highway bridge on 371. 
and then it goes all the way uh, to Lake Bemidji State Park, which is about 120 miles. But last year, I just happened to talk to a couple, or a couple different uh, individuals. One was a mother and son that flew out from Massachusetts, got a ride to Brainerd, and then biked the Paul Bunyan Trail. Another was a young man from uh, Washington, D.C. that came out to bike it. He had two days. He biked 120 miles one day, stayed at Bemidji, and biked back the next day. And I know Todd was telling me, I think the people that were working um, on the uh, trail by Essential Health, I think they had like people from nine different countries that they had helped through the construction sites. I mean, these are just the people that we saw, which is a very small number of people that use the trail. So uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic addition uh, to the park and to the Brainerd area. And that's what it looked like when it was done. Here's another shot. Um, one, there's a whole lot of really neat, unique things about Crowing State Park. Uh, in addition to the significant history, we're at the juncture of, well, actually, the Crowing River comes into the Mississippi at Crowing State Park, and that's one of the main reasons why uh, the town of Oak Crowing was even there, because the river served as major transportation routes for the uh, Native Americans and early fur traders uh, when they used their, can you know, f with canoes. The other neat thing is that we're at the junction of three of the Minnesota's three major landscapes, the pine, the prairie, and the hardwood. And uh, state parks, uh, one of our main goals is to try and uh, return our vegetation back to make it look as much as possible pre-settlement. So right here, you're looking at an area where we're doing prairie restoration. So that's an area where you can see prairie in the park. You can see there's hardwoods up ahead and we have an uh, area where we have pine too. So uh, you can see like the three major biomes in Minnesota along with the associated plants and, and unique wildlife. Here's a shot actually, that's the Mississippi River and that is taken off of the Paul Bunyan bike trail as you get closer to the highway bridge. So there are several places along the trail, the Paul Bunyan, the new trail, where you can see the Mississippi River. The neat thing about the trail is that um, DNR engineers could, had basically um, a blank palette to work with because they didn't have to follow any trails. You know, the, the designers could, um, put curves in the trail and there, uh, none of our, our um, trail is, I think there's a couple places where it's over a 5% grade, but most of it's supposed to be where there's hills under a 5% grade. The other thing is with the way designed it, people always say that no matter which way you go, you never feel like you're going uphill more one way than the other. <laughs> and another neat thing is you know, going through the varied habitats um, and each different time of the year, uh, you know, for people who are bird watchers and, you know, it's just neat to see, um, you know, the birds coming through in the spring and fall. Another picture of the trail shows a little bit of the elevation. And we see, you know, mo it's mostly bikers. Uh, I see a few rollerbladers. There were some, a uh, couple kids last summer that came out uh, with their skateboards. They came all the way out from Brainerd. Pretty ambitious. Sure. Yeah. Another shot of, uh, that was the, the first prairie area that I showed you, but this is where the bike trail goes through a little grove of oak, which is kind of neat. Fall trail shot. And here's um, like a, a, a drone shot of some of the construction that I showed you uh, where they're working on the 
the road bank um, just by the park office. It's just kind of neat to get that elevation. There's another shot. Um, that's a wetland where you have a nice view. Like I say, that's right by our park office. And um, yeah, I saw some sandhill cranes in there the other day. Sometimes you'll see um, mallards. Um, the spring frogs are really out now. Some of the things that you can see along the trail, um, you know, a lot of people see the, the white-tailed deer. Um, can see this was, the picture was taken down by our boat landing. It's a female bear and two cubs. There's one of the cubs. There's another one. And basically what, I, I just threw these in here for just kind of a, a, a neat special interest um, thing, but actually Camp Ripley uh, in the DNR had had a cup or had a female bear radio collared, and every spring they would um, tranquilize her and and do different tests and and that kind of thing, uh, weigh her, see what the cubs were like, and and um, some of the public could come in and 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 see this and. This, these were the cubs that you saw. Um, and I think she was like 14 years old. And the sad thing was um, she hardly ever ventured out of Camp Ripley or the park. But then this last June, she got on 371 and got hit, which was kind of sad. I was really looking forward to uh, seeing her again this year. Turkeys, which we see a lot of on the Paul Bunyan Trail. Coyote. Um, one thing about crowing, which is really neat, is that Camp Ripley is about 53,000 53, acres on the west side of the Mississippi and south of the crowing. And with that much habitat, we get some spillover from some of the wildlife. So we've seen um, a whole lot of wildlife that, that you can see in Minnesota every now and then. We'll see a timber wolf and, you know, the um, otters and different things. Here's some shots from our prairie. Monarch and butterfly weed. And the other thing about crowing is that there's kind of people who maybe specialize in different things. Some people are just photographers. Some people love the camp. Some people come out almost every day to hike the trails. Um, one thing that we did do last winter uh, we used to groom our ski trails, which we're not doing anymore. And in a way, I was kind of on the fence about that anyway, and the decision was made for me, we're not gonna groom them. Um, but it seemed like in the past, we were talking to as many people uh, to telling them, asking them not to walk or snowshoe on our ski trails as actually skied the trails. So now we have our ski trails opened up in the winter for people. They can, anybody can use them for snowshoeing, hiking, and that kind of thing. So um, we're, kind of, we're a unique place where people can come now and snowshoe and hike in the wintertime um, and have trails that are, are well taken care of. And you can still ski, they're just not gonna be groomed trails. Another prairie shot. A lot of times, about, about mid-June, we'll see several different turtles throughout the old crowing town site, uh, painted snappers, soft shells, laying eggs. My name is Wade Miller. I'm the area supervisor for DNR Parks and Trails here in Brainerd. And I want to be respectful of your time, so I'm going to try and fly through this as quick as I can. And if you have any questions, um, hopefully we can facilitate those. So this is the work area that our office manages. It's uh, Southern Cass County, all of Crow Wing County, and Southern Aiken County, and anything that deals with recreation. We have all forms of outdoor recreation that we have an interest in or a partnership with or a in direct involvement in, and we have both categories of non-motorized and motorized uses. So it, it's a very interesting dynamic with the different user groups we have, and so we, we manage those user groups and their recreational facilities, 
um, to ensure that folks that pay for their sport have a reasonable, safe, environmentally sound system of trails to recreate on. And we'll break uh, some of these down more as we move along. Um, there's a couple resources here at the bottom. Um, so if there's any take homes from what I have to present is uh, we have a, a DNR uh, book. It's called the Trail, Plan Trail Planning Design and Development Guidelines Manual. This was uh, made in about 2008. The DNR put this together. We hired a contractor using the techniques that um, DNR staff have developed over the years and working with uh, other partners nationwide. And we got a, the state of Minnesota got an award for this book. And we refer to it a lot when we're developing any form of trail, whether it's a hiking trail, a horse trail, a ski trail, a snowmobile trail, ATV trail. There's principles and guidelines in here for, for different techniques. And the other one we have is, um, this is a, uh, a handbook from SOBA, which is the state's association for boating access. So it's nationwide. And DNR has staff that are on the, the SOBA board and have received awards for it. And we use this in developing our recreational facilities as well, specifically water accesses, um, canoe and campsite uh, along water trails, which we'll get into in a little bit here. And if you're interested in those books, um, you can take a look at those. The, uh, the DNR's trail planning design and development guidelines are available at the DNR bookstore. I think it's 1995. And so we encourage our user groups um, to follow this if they're doing any sort of trail planning or development. The recreation units that we manage um, in the Crow Wing Cass and Aiken areas. Uh, we have state trails. We have the Paul Bunyan State Trail, which is 78 miles from Crow Wing State Park. We manage all the way up to Walker, where it meets the Heartland Trail. So our staff is signing it and blowing it and maintaining it in the uh, summer months. And in the winter months, it, um, it is groomed for snowmobiling. So snowmobile clubs groom the trail. The Cuyuna Lake State Trail, that goes right through the heart of the Cuyuna State Recreation Area and it is authorized from Brainerd to Aiken, and we're continually trying to develop that trail. And uh, someday we'll see, or our grandchildren will see, um, a connection to the Paul Bunyan Trail that you can ride all the way up to Bemidji, over to Fargo-Moorhead, to Aiken, and then over to Moose Lake, the Wisconsin border. Someday well, that will happen. We have enough trails authorized legislatively to develop those, those trails. R right now we just have 10 miles developed. Uh, we have water recreation. So we have trails and water recreation. Those are the two main activities that we work with in parks and trails. We have uh, 202 units that we manage. So in the spring, we have 202 accesses that need attention prior to fishing opener because that's the big shotgun start uh, that the recreators want to get out uh, on the water and fish and, and boat. We have 27 carry-in water accesses which are for canoe or kayak. Their remote areas are small. They might have steep grades where we, we provide a parking lot and then they can carry their watercraft down. And then 175 trailer launches that we put in concrete ramps to. In the spring, because of ice and wind and, and um, mother nature, uh, our, our ramps, our planks get buckled. They look like an accordion. So our staff um, does a an amazing job every year that we get them ready just about by every opener. Last year we didn't. Another opener, some people in our work area were ice fishing and some were on the river in a watercraft. We have six fishing piers and six shore fishing areas. A fishing pier is a wooden structure that floats and a shore fishing area is a bank of uh, a water body that we have developed that folks can go to and, and fish from shore. State water trails. We have 162 miles of state authorized water trails. They are the Pine River with 53 miles that we manage in our office. There's the Crow Wing River that we manage 34 miles and the Mississippi River that we manage that's 58 miles. And then we have Grant Nade Snowmobile Trails. We have 1,315 miles of Grant Nade Snowmobile Trails in the Brainerd area and they were voted two years ago. Crow Wing County was voted uh, best place to snowmobile in Minnesota. Uh, we, our staff doesn't do direct work on the Stonebill Trails itself, but we partner with uh, Crow Wing County as a sponsor 
to give them a grant to work with user groups and clubs to sign, groom, and maintain the landowner relationships because a lot of the snowmobile trails go across multiple ownership types. And so we administer grants to those uh, organizations to put those snowmobile trails on the ground. OHV trails, um, OHV is a bigger body for ATVs, which are all-terrain vehicles, ORVs, which are off-road vehicles, like the Jeeps, and then uh, OHMs, which are off-highway motorcycles. And we have uh, 123 miles of grant and aid trails. We have five grants that we, we give to Crow Wing County to manage those trail systems within the area. We have 27 miles of horse trails that are exclusively in the Pillsbury State Forest. There's a horse camp there that Paul manages um, and they have a beautiful facility there. It's very high use. And then we have Grant Nade Ski Trail, 62 miles, Pine Beach, Northern Arboretum, French Rapids and Larson Lake. Those are the, the units that we uh, give grants to to maintain uh, cross country skiing in the winter months. Again, that's a grant that we give to Crow Wing County and to the ski clubs that they groom, sign, and maintain those trails. Partnerships, probably the most impor important part of my job is working with our partners. Our partners vary from the Nature Conservancy to the City of Baxter to um, Crow Wing County, any township, um, any local governmental unit. We've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we work with the uh, the, the tribal band members, and we all partner to do a variety of recreational activities, whether it's putting in public water accesses, trails, parking lots. Um, we, have a, we have an agreement with the city of Baxter where the, there's a segment of the Paul Bunyan State Trail that is on all of city developed trail that, um, that we have a, a partnership with that continues that trail down to Crow Wing State Park, um, which is the final segment in our work area that we have to develop. Uh, we, uh, we have recreational grants and cooperative agreements. So recreational grants, uh, here's a list of recreational grants that we have. And then we, we have cooperative agreements. So recreational grants are for local units of government to establish, develop, maintain, or manage recreational facilities. If you have a facility and you're a local unit of government or you have partners, um, you can apply for a grant to connect trails, um, develop parks, um, water accesses, and then we have cooperative agreements, and those cooperative agreements are where the DNR, the state of Minnesota, enters into an agreement with a local unit of government saying, we're gonna help you, and you can help us. And sometimes it's as simple as a township or a city or a, the county has land, and they want a recreational facility. So we'll partner with them through, a, through an agreement that says, okay, we're gonna acknowledge that you have land, and we'll spend the money to develop that but we'll develop it, but you agree to maintain it. And they agree to that, and so it's done. And we have several, several agreements in place here in Crow Wing County. We have great partners with all the cities that we have around here, Crosby, Pine River, Pequot, Nisswa. We're developing a public water access in Nisswa, and we're partnering with uh, Nisswa, city of Nisswa. They're developing a city park, and there's a tunnel under 371 right now that leads to nothing but someday it'll lead to a beautiful water access site in a, in, a, in a city park and we're gonna make it look seamless so you can't tell that here's DNR land and here's city land. And so we do a lot of partnering. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have anything else other than if you guys have any, any questions. I know I sped through this, but I want to be respectful of your time. So if you have any questions or want to look at any of these books, feel free, I do have business cards too as we seem to partner with everybody all the time and we never know who our next partner is. So the area on the map that I have, which is all of Crow Wing County, here's Crow Wing County right here, this long skinny one. Everything within that county and this is Cass County or Southern Cass County. This is Highway 200. So everything in Southern Cass County and then everything south of Highway 210 in Aiken County, down to the Morrison County line and Mille Lacs County lines. And we do manage all the public water accesses around Mille Lacs. So those are really a lot of assets. That's very small. Yeah. Very small area. I was assuming you were talking about bigger 
No, uh, so our, our division or our, our department has talked about watershed management. And being in the recreation business, I always argue and advocate for uh, population management or um, people sheds instead of watersheds, right? Um, Crow Wing County, um, there's, there's graphs out there by, by surveys that have been conducted that this is a very high use population destination. And rightfully so, there's a lot of recreation and natural resources here that people flock to enjoy. And so I'm fortunate enough to have the, the opportunity to work with so many great people and so many resources to connect the people with that resource. Wade, could Sorry. you talk, um, Wade coordinates, I don't know, I forget the name of the group, but it's a regional multi-user group that would meet here, here periodically. Um, to coordinate, you want to talk about that a little bit? That's a great story. Yep, story. so many. Yeah, it, it actually changed here about a year and a half ago. But um, we used to ha we have what's called the Brainerd Baxter Area, or excuse me, the Brainerd Lakes Area Trail Coordination Committee, and it's a group of per resource professionals and partners that meet together to figure out what everybody's doing and where we intersect or can partner on certain things. And it would have folks like the Nature Conservancy, the Soil and Water Conservation District, the City of Brainerd, the City of Baxter. Um, city of Nisswa, if they're doing something, uh, the city of East Gull Lake, because they're developing a trail around uh, Gull Lake to connect to the Paul Bunyan one day. And uh, it's, a, it's a venue and, and an opportunity for all of us to connect, network, and, and figure out what everybody's doing. Because when you're in the recreation business, your focus is here for now, and there are folk, folks just a step over that are, that are doing similar um, things, and, and a lot of times we're, we're focused on our on our path and we, we don't look to the side. And so this opportunity that Todd mentioned is just that. We can figure out what each of us is doing and figure out where we can partner. Yes? So is that who we go to to get a bridge over 371 for biking? Uh, no, you gotta go to the legislature. <laughs> 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 They're just down the road. <laughs> uh, uh, no, you know, that group, that group is very well informed and advocates well on getting a bridge across 371, myself included. I know the city of Baxter, I know the city of Brainerd. We wanna connect people to recreation safely and 371 is, is a near top priority for all of us. We are charged with um, doing what we're told so we don't get to say what gets to be done. Um, that's the legislature that ultimately from the state's perspective that has to authorize the money to develop it. And then we'll go out here, once they give us a pot of money, then we'll go and work with the engineers and the partners and make sure it happens and it's in place. You know, right now, uh, for example, um, the Highway 371 expansion north of Nisswa up to Jenkins, um, the Paul Bunyan Trail is getting realigned. It was very important to DNR that we keep our trail users connected. So one of the requirements we had for MnDOT when they were developing this project was the trail needed to be kept whole. So they're gonna realign the Paul Bunyan Trail in certain portions and they're gonna put a bridge across that 371 by Pequot. Um, yep, but that, and that, and that's one of those things where timing worked out for us because they were impacting our trail. And so what they've done temporarily, if you've been on the Paul Bunyan Trail north of Brainerd or north of Nisswa, is they have small little temporary reroutes that they've asphalted around keeping the ADA component in place, no, no greater than 5% slope. And those are just the temporary ones while they're building us new trail over here. And then one day the trail will be closed where they connect those two ends and the trail will be made whole again. And that'll all be done this year. That'll all be completed by fall. Can you tell us what the different colors mean on this? Uh, I can attempt to. So this color here is the Paul Bunyan State Trail. Okay, this one here is the Cuyuna Lake State Trail. The, uh, this system here is a grant and aid ATV trail on Crow Wing County lands by um, Miller Black Bear Lakes. Um, this is a Spider Lake all-terrain ORV, ATV, and OHM trail system um, in Cass County. The, uh, the dots you see all over are public water accesses and because the zoom level is what it is on here, there are different colored dots on this map um, that indicate if it's a DNR managed, our staff takes care of it, or if it's a partner access. 
And so when the phone rings, because there's so many lakes that I haven't been to in this work area, um, I need that map. This is, my, this is a, a map that I have in my office that I can see great detail in. And someone will talk about a lake that I may never have heard of, or they'll say a bass lake, and there's only like 10 in my work area, right? But they might be talking about a, a bass lake somewhere else, and, and some of our bass lakes are ours, and some are partners, right? So um, all, the, all the dots you see are, are um, public water accesses. The little segments of trail or, or lines here indicate there's a forest there's forest land there and there's a trail, whether it's a forest road or, or someplace, it's a mapped uh, recreational opportunity. So in the Pillsbury State Forest, it's closed to motorized, well, off highway vehicle use, you can drive vehicles through it, but uh, all the trails in there are non-motorized. They're either horse, ski, hiking, biking, cross country skiing. Um, in the winter months, there's snowmobile trails that go in there, but in the summer months, it's a non-motorized forest and there are, uh, there's trails in there. So these represent those trails, and if you were to zoom in there, you'd see somewhere around 30 some miles of trails. Let's thank our three.